Alex, welcome to Startup Grind. It's great to have you here with us. You've been a long supporter of Startup Grind. Yes, um, this is my second time to be a, a speaker in the event, and thanks so much for the invitation. So we have a fairly global audience uh, today. Uh, so maybe Alex, you can start by making a short introduction of yourself and sort of um, where you're, where you, where you're from, and so on. Okay, sure. Like, okay, thanks so much. Um, good morning and good evening. Um, I'm currently based in Hong Kong. I'm Alex. I'm Alex So. Uh, I'm the group managing partner of Fasting Group. And I'm pleased to have the opportunity to share some tips with you today to talk about like avoiding financial mistake or having having a better way to manage the cash flow when you're running the company. A bit about myself, my professional background, my working background. Um, Fastlane uh, was found in 2013 with my two of my university friends. Uh, with the idea to provide great professional and modern accounting service to the markets. And prior to that, I worked in a number of global financial institutions and private equity firms as the CFO of the business. So I managed, I managed the full aspect of finance operations and planning, as well as an investment committee member in the private equity business as well. Yeah, so you 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 help startups with their uh, accounting and financial needs, but you also invest in startups. So you, you know the inside of a startup and you know what challenges they have. Um, before we go into the questions, maybe you just can just tell us a little bit of the services that Fastlane provides. Sure. Yes, um, we are Hong Kong based CPA accounting and corporate services firm. So we focus on helping entrepreneurs, startup and SMEs to manage their accounting, taxation, <laughs> HR and other compliance needs. Uh, we make use of technology such as cloud accounting and other SaaS platform to support our clients' business and help them to implement digital transformation uh, such as their accounting and payroll functions. Mm. And now we have a lot of we have people from all different jurisdictions around the world but regardless of where you are in the world for me the accounting the money the the money is the flow or the oil in your machinery because you need to pay suppliers you need to you need to pay your staff and so on so whenever money becomes a problem in a startup or any company it sort of can easily grind to a halt and it can be uh, painful to try to sort that out. So that's the background to this event. So what we want to do today is to go through a number of questions um, and then Alex will talk to those questions and then we follow up also in the Q&A. So the first question is, how do you avoid payment confusion? All right, I think um, basically you need to have a very clear payment terms to the client. Um, this is confusing, it could be confusing um, if you not make it clear. For instance, um, your client may not realize the pay when the payment is due or what kind of payment methods uh, will be accepted. So to avoid confusion, the best is to have specific clauses in your invoice and your engagement letters outlining the payment terms. Say, for example, when you issue an engagement letter, make it clear that the subsequent issues is to be settled within 30 days, 45 days of the completion of engagement or other terms that you think is important to you. And when you make an invoice, and like in Hong Kong, we say Hong Kong dollar, and we say just dollars sometimes. So you have Singapore, Singapore dollars, and US dollars. So that, of course, can be a bit confusing if you're not 100% sure what currency was it that you actually sent the invoice in. That's correct, yeah. Now, getting money, I mean, as we said, the money is the oil in the machinery. And the more money you have as a company, the more you can invest and you can expand. So how do you get paid faster? Well, that's, um, that's a very good question. What I see often enough is, um, our clients or, or business, they actually don't send the invoice fast enough. They didn't send it quickly. And uh, my advice is to really, you have to send it as quick as possible and as accurate as possible, right? Um, and send it out, you can use email to send it out. 
Um, I think in the good old days, people still relying on on posts. But now I think um, sending email out is definitely the way to go with the attachments. And also, you can also um, make sure that you send the right person. Uh, what I often see is that um, the invoice sent to the person actually, you know, discussing with you about engagement, but not the accounting department is not being aware of. So I think it's make sure that you find the right person in terms of settling the, the invoice. Um, and uh, I think also the, the details of the invoice is also very important that uh, it has to be correct, has to be checked uh, before you send it out. Um, so that your client will not find an excuse about, you know, about the details is not right and not not, not paying you and try to take the longer to process your invoice because it's just simply not correct. Yeah, and, and that's that is a, a a common problem also with when you also work with larger companies because the person who you might have talked to, sold to, he or she might not be uh, authorized uh, and should not be the name on the actual invoice. It should be somebody else's name or a department's name. And then it gets bounced around and then it gets delayed. Now, you talked about sending invoices by email as PDF and so on. So how do you make it easy for the client to pay? Well, you need to think about from a client perspective. Um, so you want to provide more options. Um, think about um, like offering more options uh, for them to settle. Um, so they won't find it too difficult um, to pay you. Um, let's say um, what I see is uh, if I need to make a payment, even using internet banking, I need to set up you know, the payee, I need to set up a lot of things before actually I can make the payment. That is not easy, I would say. So think about using payment gateways. Uh, think about accepting debit card or credit cards. Think about alternative uh, forms of payment, um, such as PayPal, Stripe. In Hong Kong, we accept, we have business pay me, we business can pay me. We have faster payment in Hong Kong, and it's really good to use. So it's very simple. Uh, you set it up, you send the link, and um, your client can just click and pay. Yeah, and and making the options um, super simple for the client. Of course, if you are telling the client you can pay through a credit card, then you as a receiver will get less money because you have a credit card. There's a charge for using a credit card, but it's fast. Um, another thing I can I can say that I've seen is that. Sometimes when people write account numbers in a PDF, if you keep them just as a string of letters without spaces, much, much easier for the person to copy the right number rather than have to retype it. All of those things make it easy. Now, the other thing is now you you found a client, you, you've done some business with them, and you're gonna send them the invoice, but how do you make sure the how do you make sure the client can pay? Well, I guess it's, um, I think it's quite typical that you need to do some KYC. You need to know your client, you know who they are, um, you know why they come to you for services, do they have references, um, you know, you see any negative news. Um, but I think in terms of paying, even if they have like, you know, you know who they are, who recommend to you, but sometimes uh, it may worth to do some credit check. Uh, it costs you a bit of money, uh, but it actually helps you to give you some insights in terms of yeah, the financial standing. Um, yes, um, and all I can see a lot of uh, clients, they are not really doing any check, uh, not just not credit check, but they just don't do any check. So it's very important that at least you understand who they are uh, and if the amount is substantial. Um, yeah, and especially uh, for the service that you uh, you are going to provide will cost you a lot of money, right? So you want to make sure that you know you spend the money to provide them the services are good, you are able to get it back. So in that case, I would strongly recommend to do some credit check because you are you have to pay before actually you getting back. So that will have a big impact if you're not going to get the money back, uh, and you will be in big trouble. Yeah, and also when you and you should work those charges into your basically the charge for your service, so that if you say I need to make a credit card check on each client, well, that you need to cover that when you it's part of your expenses as uh, as operations. 
Now, when we're in Hong Kong or in Singapore and so on, then it might be slightly easier to find out if the client can pay, can or cannot pay. But how do you make sure that a client can pay internationally? Well, I think um, generally speaking, I think uh, paying uh, cross cross border payment is not a real issue. I mean, uh, you know, you know, sending payments between countries and banks and uh, SWIFT uh, bank transfer. I mean, those are the you know you know infrastructure that we already enjoy. I think just being mindful that certain countries they have restriction uh, on their currency control, uh, which affect. Not necessarily they cannot pay, but it take longer time, they take a longer period to settle the payments. So make sure you understand. Uh, maybe you can also ask your client whether they actually paid before. Do they actually pay overseas before? You want to ask if they have experience doing so. So you know that you, they understand the process, the procedures. Uh, so there's no certain surprises in excuses not knowing how to pay. Um, and also, I guess is um, you can also ask to your your client to pay locally. They may have operations locally, or maybe they are there's a way for them to pay locally. So it's not necessary they have to pay internationally. Sometimes international payment they incur heavy charges. Um, so it's just not that they can pay or not pay, but how to find the best way that they can actually settle your invoice locally uh, without incurring extra processing time and cost. Yeah, and, and you mentioned the SWIFT and, and uh, those kind of and, you know, I say identifiers that you need to have so that your bank can receive the money. And I think a good tip here is that you should talk to your bank before you do asking for an overseas payment. You go to your bank and say, hey, can you give us the latest you know, SWIFT and, and those numbers? And it often comes in a PDF, and then you can give that PDF to your client overseas and say, here are the, all the numbers that you need, sort of generic ones. And then, of course, you will have that uh, specific account number and your, your company name. Um, now, when we talk about payment, it sometimes can often sound that, oh, it's the accounting departments. So that's, that's the ones who are responsible. But who is really responsible for a client paying? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I cannot say, I don't disagree with you, it's the accounting department at the end of the day. Um, it has to do with the numbers and have to do with all this uh, payment uh, and, and, and chasing for payment and, and things like that. Uh, but I would say, I think it's, it's really, it's a collective effort from the company. Uh, because at the end of the day, if everyone put a good effort, but no one get paid, um, it's not just affecting the account department or the boss, uh, but everyone. I mean, so I will believe it's, it's more like a culture. It's like let them understand, like okay, um, work towards the client um, from every aspect, like from the sales, right? From from the salesperson, uh, like talk to the client, get the deal closed. Um, I think he or she has to maintain the regular content, making sure things are delivered, making sure that things are on track. Um, any red flag they can see, they should, you know, tell um, the kind of department or the, or the, or the delivery pe people. So I guess it's like it's a, it's a coordination, coordinated effort. Not until the very last minute everything's get done, and then you send the invoice, and then you you get them pay, and then you start asking your salesperson and say, okay, who's the responsible person? Who's that? Uh, that will not be the ideal situation. Uh, the other thing I would say is to have a, a clear procedures, uh, steps. So yes, everyone is involved. Everyone should be responsible in a way. So I think it should be again um, easy to for everyone to understand to have an internal process uh, and steps and who is responsible for what and under what circumstances, what need to be escalated to whom. Um, I think a clear process and a clear communication among the team is also helpful as well. Yeah, I totally agree and try to avoid those uh, silos. And I think in the so many people move into the startup world because you want to avoid having those corporate silos. And that now when you set up your own company, you want to avoid creating those silos. So yes, make sure that any payment or any client who hasn't paid that you kind of give that feedback the person who actually are uh, 
responsible for finding new clients and how they can say, oh, that that's one we probably should ask for early payment or this one seems okay. Like so, and then we're going to come back to the CRM system later. But um, yeah, how can you how can you help clients pay early? Good question. Um, give them incentive. Give them a good reason to pay you early or pay you um, upfront. Let's say, let's say if you can um, um, pay like a, it's, it's very common. Like you know, you pay uh, you know annual subscription, you got a discount. So in a way, you encourage your client to pay early, right? Um, but not not again. It's not all the business actually can provide like a subscription based sort of model. So, but the idea is really help them to motivate them to um, pay you early. Uh, the, the flip side is that uh, you want to make sure that there's late payments. They are they're possible incurring fee charges and interest payments and, and mean fee. Uh, I think you need to make sure that it stay clearly in the invoice um, so that they know that if you have to uh, make use of those clauses, you know, making charges and, and late payment, um, you know, they, they know that they have to pay for it. And if you can waive it, so let's say they they are late, but maybe you can say, okay, I waive it. But if you pay pay it now, I can waive your certain fee. So I think it's another way to negotiate and to really encourage your client to pay you early or pay in time. Yeah, and now we you, we have audience we have an audience from all over the world. So what you want to do is look locally at what payment terms are often used. And you can just maybe check electricity bills and utility bills and say, OK, you will often find some standard language, which you can then use because that standard language is within your jurisdiction. Some people are known for it. As, as you said, Alex, you can waive it. But if you don't have any increased cost due to late payment, then the late payment can just become later and later and later. And there is no incentive to pay on time. Now, we talk a lot about software as a services within startups. So is prepayment the ideal solution? I would say yes, uh, in a way. I mean, if your business model is, you know, is a SaaS model, yes, because you know that um, really like, uh, you know, you have well-defined the services. And so you pretty know how much you are going to charge is a fixed fee. Um, but then um, it really depends on, on, on the on the business model. Uh, but I guess it's also um, the industry practice, um, whether it's something acceptable people want to do the, the prepayment uh, model, because uh, some sometimes the, the competition is very high. Uh, if you ask for like annual payment, they you know don't want to really bother. And I think SAR sometimes is selling about uh, if you if you use your services, you subscribe. If you don't want to use it, you you just discontinue. So it's really they are encouraging sort of like shorter sort of, you know, easy to get, let you out around and trying to get a really sort of big payment, um, you know, request. Um, and also if your services um, uh, is well defined and that's okay, but you cut out potentially other out of scope services. You cut out some out, upselling or cross selling because Hey, you know, you pay me upfront um, now. You know, we don't talk about this. This, you know, sort of like you know, paying, settling because this is well defined. Um, but if you are able to uh, provide the services and have a regular dialogue, so obviously potentially you can um, have more businesses. Yeah, it's a very good point about a uh, add-on sales or upselling. Uh, you might have a number of services that you are providing and then you can have that second list of add-on sales that everybody kind of knows about so that you can when asked for it then you can put that in there and, and get that also uh, so as you said if you do a, a big prepayment you might have locked yourself in in a way that is hard to add those extra services how do you communicate with a client that has not paid well um well, what I see is today, not just um, not paying, I think in generally speaking, I think people rely too much on email, right? So um, yeah, you know, the accounting department is just sending an invoice, email them and wait and wait and wait and wait. 
they didn't even really think about you know calling them right just give them a call a courtesy call or even some client now they don't want to not really like pick up phone calls you can think about like whatsapp them well I mean, we do actually use whatsapp um, to contact our client not just chasing for payment but think about what's the most effective way to communicate with the client um, calling client using whatsapp or other means of uh, messaging tools actually help uh, I think it's and I think it's also you don't have to wait until like it's a long overdue. You should have a regular sort of conversations to understand where they are. Are they are they having difficulties? Uh, if they have difficulties, and then you can work with them about like a payment schedule, a repayment schedule. Uh, so I think it's having engaging your clients is very important. Not just send an email and wait. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's also why it's important to through the company from sales all the way to the one who sends the invoice that need to talk to each other and say, oh, this client has been paid. And the one who met the client or had the onboarding call with the client might be the best person to sort of reach out and say, hey, we haven't received anything. What's going on? Um, how do you manage cash flow? Wow, it's, uh, it's quite a big topic. Um, I guess, A, I mean, you, you need to know your accounts. I mean, obviously, as accountant running a CPA firm, obviously say, hey, you know, you, you need to know your numbers. You you really have to do it, you know, on a regular basis. And regular basis, I would say on a monthly basis, um, then you, you know, take a look at your, your income, uh, take a look at your expenses, by having everything put into the right places. Um, so right places meaning that you may need the tools, you may need the kind of software or something to help you out. Um, and um, I think that is the, the account, the, the numbers, you need to know the numbers. Once you know the numbers, then you can have actions, right? So you can think about, hey, look, um, do I need to talk to that client because the client is not paying me? But if I don't have the numbers, how do I know how much he or she is owning me? So that means I need to have the facts and data first and then put it into the systems. I can pull the information out and then I can, you know, come, you know, talk to my client. Um, and sometimes uh, I would say you don't have to be too friendly about asking for payment because I would say you, you deserve to get paid. Uh, sometimes I see people a bit sort of like feeling not too, too well or embarrassed to chase a client for payment. They give me business, but why I'm chasing? But I think having a, a, a assertive and being polite and professional, if they overdo, then you should uh, explain to them, you know, it's created some sort of trouble for your company and I think they understand it. Um, and I, I would say also um, for managing cash flow, uh, you need the data, you tell the client um, and I think it's also important that you keep your, your, your business and personal finance separately um, so that you don't, so, so the company has, has money, so maybe the money is not really generated from the business, it's more like your money, or maybe the business have, have enough money, but you are spending it out because you think that you own the business. So, so what I would say is to keep the business and personal money separate uh, so that you can have a clear picture. Uh, to look at your, your your liquidity issues or your cash flow issues, uh, and I would say also uh, having some cash buffer. I always have some. I I'm not idle, but cash reserve in in the company. Typically, I would say probably twelve months maximum sort of operating cash flow, so that you will have enough buffer to deal with any unforeseeable situation. Yeah, I think that that is, um, I think as a start, this is what I would say, um, managing cash flow in, in that sort of order. Mm, totally agree. And sometimes you can you can think about the heartbeat of your company. You learn how the company, you know, you're, you're sending the invoices and you, of course, want to grow. So it's going to be ups and downs, up and down, up and down and going up, 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 hopefully. Um, the other one, if you're selling, well, any form of service where there is some kind of length to the agreement, you will have what I sometimes call the, the cliff, where you're going to see that, oh, in January next year, after that, we don't really have any many more clients. So then, of course, the sales team needs to be able to start to fill February and March and, and so on. So 
having a good view of your company is, is very important. How do you know if your financials are sound? Well, I guess you have to check it. You have you need the numbers. Uh, you need to put all the numbers together, but you really need to sit down and review the numbers. Uh, I often see that, you know, the business owner could be very busy. They never actually have the time to sit down and look at the numbers. Uh, despite the fact that they have accountants helping them, despite the, the fact that they are accounting firm having them, but they really have to sit down and to really look at their revenue, right, the income, uh, look at the cost. Um, I think it's really important to just really spend some time each month, really to sit down and go through the numbers. And I would say if uh, if the company actually ha is owned by more than one person, let's say they are you know, a couple of directors or shareholders, uh, maybe it's too much to do it on a monthly basis together, but I strongly recommend that they do it like a quarterly or half yearly to communicate, to look at the numbers, think about what they have done right, what they have done not so right, what are the plan, uh, what what are the what are the areas they want to spend more money, where are the areas they can maybe save a little bit more, where where they spend the money actually have the most return. Uh, I think they need to really look at it um, yeah, on on a regular basis. Yeah, because it's not it's not about blaming somebody. It's about building a better company and the best way of building a better company is to learn where the money went and what so sort of, if you have some different services which ones gave the most return what should you do if you find out that you're you're not financially sound well big problem <laughs> um, well i guess is uh, there's a couple of reasons uh, why why you know it's not profitable why you know it's not doing well I guess you have to look at like, you know, when we talk about this invoice, I mean, do you have a good process to send out the invoice? Do you have a good process to you chase for payments? Do you have resources, enough you know, resources um, to making sure that your numbers is, is, is ready? Um, you know, there are various reasons. Uh, it could be even fundamentally your service or products that are your offering cannot generate positive financial results. Maybe due to you know the change of the customer behavior, maybe the cost is you know getting more expensive because of inflation. Um, so we really need to look at all these um, areas. And um, again, I would say look for professional help if you cannot figure out what's going wrong, or you know we want some tips, or advice, um, how to do better. I think um, you know accountants by default is. Uh, you know, uh, is is the way to is a is a way to sort of like helping you to talk about numbers, right? Yeah, and, and don't don't go it alone. If you have a problem, talk to you talk to your accountant, talk to your friends, talk to other founders, and say, okay, this is the picture I see. Uh, you know, it doesn't 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 seem to work out, or doesn't. So always have that outside perspective um, to help you. Now. So far, we've spoken a lot about sort of the, the fundamentals of, of uh, how to keep track of your accounting and invoicing and so on. So let's move into some of the sort of tools that you can use. So what tools are there to check if a client can or cannot pay? Well, I think, um, I think again, um, generally speaking, um, you know, you need to find a suitable piece of accounting software, right? Um, big company, small company, I mean, everyone is using some sort of tools, right? Um, yeah, so I think for a startup, SME, entrepreneur, there are quite a number of accounting software, cloud accounting software that actually can use. Um, you know, when I talk about cloud accounting software, meaning that actually you can log in, you can see the numbers, you can book transactions, you can send invoices. Um, so you, you don't have to wait for your accountant to Gives you information because if things being done, uh, if you have if you set up properly, you got some training to use it. Um, then basically you can pull a lot, pull out a lot of useful information from the systems. Uh, first thing being uh, a zero partner, X E R O zero uh, partner uh, for for the last I would say eight to nine years already since we start the firm is a cloud thing software. Uh, we use it a lot. Of people like it, uh, so this is one of the options that you can consider. Um, yeah, so I would say definitely 
whether it's a zero or other software, uh, I, I do believe that you need to uh, set it up properly um, with the right accounting concepts, uh, with the right structures. So I think it's very important to set up the system properly. Not super difficult, but if you don't have the accounting knowledge, then probably again you need to talk to you know an accounting firm. They know how to use a modern accounting software to help you set it up, give you the training. And then you can draw the information out and do some analysis and, and run your company. Yeah, and in now we're in also getting them back to a number of different jurisdictions. In some places around the world, I'm right now visiting Sweden, the banks do actually provide a basic accounting software as part of having a corporate account. And of course, that's a great way of getting started. So wherever you are who is listening right now around in the world i mean reach out to alex if you're in hong kong if you're in in another place reach out to the local startup grind chapter uh, and kind of also check with your other co-founders which which banks do have this kind of system built in or which don't so that you can take it get an idea of what works in your market now we also spoke about the process the sort of from sales all the way to sending the invoice. So what tools are there and what would you say is good to use to keep everything together? Okay, um, I would say the accounting software I mentioned, like Cero, uh, is, uh, is a popular software. Um, I guess they have over two to three million subscribers using uh, this software uh, from 150 countries. Um, so it's, it's a software actually not restricted by certain jurisdiction. This is a kind of software is set up properly. Uh, it is good to go for different accounting standards, uh, like international account standard, Hong Kong account standard, or even US, or UK. Um, so you really want to find a software which is like quite versatile uh, in terms of uh, different uh, jurisdiction. Um, and also there are tools. Um, the tools actually connect with zero. So that means it's not just a software, one software, but they have an ecosystem. Um, they can connect with your CRM system, they can connect with your banks, and you can connect with even like a, like a credit control systems, like a, like a chasing software. A software actually you can set it up, um, and then um, so it will send out multiple payment reminders to your, your clients. So you don't need to do the, the manual email you know, by yourself, uh, it's automated, and for each reminder, depending on the number of days of overdue, let's say one week overdue or one month overdue or maybe three months overdue, you can customize uh, the language for each reminder. Uh, so every every week, every month, you just run the schedule, it will send it out uh, to your clients, and whenever you actually get paid, because it's linked to your account software, it's being reconciled, so again, it will pump out another sort of like aging report. You can see who actually not paying. So you want to make sure that, hey, look, you have a process in place. You've got a system helping you automate the process rather than just, you know, spend hours and trying to find out who is not paying you. And then you spend more time with your client, understand the situation rather than just crunching the numbers. Yeah, and I love the word automate because that's it's all about trying so you can focus on your business, but the uh, the accounting and the CRM that everybody's everything speaks to each other. And then you should also, of course, check with your bank. Are they connected? And, and if they're not, you can give them a kind of a push and say, hey, you kind of you should be in the modern world and connect. Now, before we move into the uh, the Q&A, uh, where do you see payments going into the future? Uh, it's very exciting, I would say. Uh, I think payment industry has continu continuously evolved uh, for the past many, many years. Um, I think before when I when I study in university, when we talk about payment, uh, we, 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 we know that it's done by the bank, all right? Banks doing two things, taking deposit, making loans and doing the payments. Now, so payment no longer being, you know, owned by the bank, so it's being, you know, uh, open up, um, so it's become a payment industry on its own, uh, and I think it's getting better each day from a technology point of view. Um, there are lots of options out there, and you know, well, now I can use my Apple Watch to spend 
you know, for almost everything for my day to day. I don't even need the wallet with me. I can just pay unless I need to have a wallet to carry my physical ID card in Hong Kong. Otherwise, I don't really need a cash. I don't really need a wallet. So, so payment actually is getting, you know, more easier to use uh, and uh, go to everyone's life. Um, and I think in the future, I, I do believe that blockchain technology will, will have a key uh, role to play here uh, for, for payment. Uh, I would say uh, because it has a lower processing fee, right? It's faster speed of payment. You don't need to go, go through the old systems like uh, like SWIFT, so like decades old, like I don't know how long, but at least 30, 30, 40 years sort of infrastructure they have in place. It's kind of slow, it kind of, uh, expensive of the infrastructure they have. So I, I think blockchain definitely is, is very interesting. Um, I think the hurdle will be the KYC because, you know, everyone is using blockchain and who is actually behind, um, you know, the wallets, right? Um, and I think that is something that needs to be regulated uh, so that people are more comfortable uh, receiving the money because if I get paid, I want to make sure that, hey, it's, it's the client paying me, not someone else. Uh, because there are money laundering issues behind that. So technology-wise, I think it's going in the right direction, but how the regulation actually enable it, how to um, provide more sort of um, supervision uh, in terms of those KYC ML issues, I think that's that's very important. Um, and I, I think uh, even recently, you look at, uh, I just Googled up the, the recent news, Google actually announced partnering with Coinbase to accept payments, uh, crypto payments for the cloud services. So they are big boys, they are, you know, uh, big company actually, they are leading the way uh, using block blockchain as a way to uh, accept payments. So yeah, I'm very positive about this, uh, this, this sort of um, trend. Mm. Yeah, the interest, the, the future is very interesting and there are, a lot of small things and, and big things that can be sold and startups are there to, to solve them. Um, Alex, big thank you for helping us with these questions. What we're going to do now is I'm going to bring Margaret on and let's see if we have any questions from the audience.